Hello and welcome to South Asia Today, a show that provides you the glimpses of South Asia. I'm your host Yeshi. Here are the headlines. Nepal evacuates citizens from China. Pakistan is still awaiting their government to take response. Afghanistan's President Ghani dedicates victory to Afghan people after winning polls. Manipur's Naga community in New Delhi celebrates Sea Sewing Festival. And now for all the details. Nepal's government evacuated over 150 Nepali citizens from Hubei province of China. A chartered plane of Nepal Airlines took off from Kathmandu to Wuhan to bring Nepali citizens back home to protect them from getting hit by coronavirus. The repatriated citizens have been quarantined in Bhaktapur city of Nepal to conduct tests and examinations. Meanwhile, Pakistani mothers have been urging the government to bring their children back from China. But the Imran Khan government seems more sensitive towards protecting its diplomatic ties with China than its own citizens. Our report. This week, citizens of Nepal residing in China finally took a deep sigh of relief after getting evacuated from the coronavirus-hit country. On February 15th, the government of Nepal had sent a Nepal Airlines airplane to evacuate its citizens stranded in Hubei province of China, which is the epicenter of deadly coronavirus outbreak. As informed by the Secretary of Nepal's Prime Minister Office Narayan Bidari, based on the preliminary reports, all the evacuated citizens are healthy. However, 175 evacuated Nepali citizens have been kept in quarantine for 14 days and are undergoing medical tests and treatments as required. The quarantine facilities have been set up in Nepal as per the recommendations of World Health Organization. Nepal Red Cross Society has also set up desks outside the quarantine camp and pamphlets are being distributed to create awareness among people about the disease. I am in Nepal Red Cross Society. I am in the coronavirus. I am in the Jonathan Chetanako, Persa Persarko, Lagi, Kosari. I am in Bosna Sokson, Kosari, and Upai or Sokin Saban. I am in Jonathan Chetanako, I am in Persa Matra, Persa, and Gonoko Persa Matra, Titic Matra, and Lavi, and Escolite, and Orgut Hakolite, and Amosor, and the Kikamu. Well, governments of other South Asian countries have put in their maximum and best resources to bring their citizens back from China. Till the medical situation returns to normal, Pakistan has left its citizens on their faith for fighting the coronavirus epidemic. Pakistani Mahamali Khan was supposed to return home two weeks ago after collecting her degree at Yangtze University in Xingzhou of Hubei, China. However, the 25-year-old medical student has found herself trapped in the country with no end in sight after authorities imposed a lockdown on the city before she could leave amid the rapidly spreading coronavirus outbreak. Her mother, Farah Kanwal, in Karachi said her only daughter left Pakistan on December 3 and was expected to return on January 29. Her area was sealed off on January 24 after the outbreak of coronavirus a day after she was awarded her graduation certificate. अभी तक तो मुझे नहीं लग रहा कि गवर्नमेंट कुछ कर रही है क्योंकि जो असल जगह है ह्यूबे प्रोविंस वहां से तो कोई भी पाकिस्तान नहीं आया है अभी तक तो उनको वहां कुछ कुछ, कुछ ना कुछ तो उनको करना चाहिए ना कि आप और जगहों से बीजिंग से ला रहे हैं फ्लाइट हैं शंघाई से फ्लाइट आ रही हैं पाकिस्तान के लोग आ रहे हैं ना चाइनीज भी आ रहे हैं तो इन बच्चों जो सही हैं बिल्कुल Maham is one of more than 1,000 Pakistani students in China's Hubei province, the epicenter of the coronavirus, who have been told by their government that it has had to rule out their return home for the moment. So far, India, USA, Canada, Ukraine and including other countries have already evacuated their citizens from Wuhan. The death toll from coronavirus outbreak in mainland China has reached 1,770. Moving on, US President Donald Trump is scheduled to arrive in India on his two-day maiden visit. A high-level delegation will accompany him to discuss and deliberate upon the entire gamut of bilateral ties. Security agreements, which the US have been pushing for a long time, are going to be finalized during the visit. Cities that Trump will visit are being decked up to honor him a historic welcome. Ahmedabad, 
the key city of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's home state of Gujarat is on a beautification spree to welcome the US President Donald Trump. Routes are decked with lights and flowers to welcome the President. Trump, his wife Melania and the delegation will be treated to rich Indian culture upon their arrival in the city. World's largest cricket stadium, Motera, is all set for an event named Namaste Trump, where Trump and Modi will jointly address the crowd. The North Indian city of Agra is also bracing up to welcome Trump, who plans to view famed monument of love, Taj Mahal, at sunset. There will be a session of extensive engagement between two sides and they are expected to narrow down differences over tariffs and discuss U.S. demands for greater access to India's poultry and dairy markets. We would not like to rush into a deal as the issues involved are complicated and there are many decisions which actually could affect or impact the lives of millions of people on the ground and some also with long-term economic consequences. So we don't want to create any artificial deadline. India tightening the intellectual property rights regime would be a step towards addressing US concerns on a matter pending between the two countries for decades. India was among 10 countries placed on a priority watch list by the US Trade Representative's Office for IP violations in April 2019, according to news reports. They are also expected to shore up cooperation in counter-terrorism and intelligence gathering as well as remove irritants in commercial relations. But overall, we are looking at this visit to strengthen the strategic global partnership between India and the United States. Aiming to start a long-running project, U.S. energy firm Westinghouse is expected to sign a new agreement with the state-run Nuclear Power Corporation of India for the supply of six nuclear reactors. The agreement will lay out timelines and the lead local constructor for the reactors to be built at Kovada in southern India and also address lingering concerns over India's nuclear liability law. Last year, the two governments announced they were committed to the establishment of the six reactors. Just days before Trump's arrival, India has also cleared a $2.1 billion defense deal confirming the purchase of 24 MH-60R multi-role helicopters for the Navy. Moving on. Kashmiri activists have rejected the bombastic rhetoric of Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan in which he spewed Islamabad manufactured anti-India venom to secure Kashmiri people's confidence. A Kashmiri leader condemned Erdogan for even talking about human rights for Erdogan himself was an agent slaughter of civil rights and a brutal suppressor of dissent. Kashmiris have also accused Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan of spinning propaganda on Kashmir to mislead the international community. Our report. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan read out a long, monotonous script in front of a joint session of the Pakistani parliament. Each word and sentence was, of course, written in Pakistani Prime Minister's office. It sounded like a political hate speech, aiming to appease one particular section. Erdogan, who has been deemed human rights violator by several media houses and forums across the world, tried to paint the prosperous region of Jammu and Kashmir as a region deprived of fundamental rights. An Islamic undertone was his idea of garnering support, but Kashmiris, who have been suffering under Pakistani occupation for more than seven decades, rejected all his propositions, saying he was not thinking about Kashmiris' welfare, but his empire. Take two Kashmiri, a human rights defender, or Kashmir cause, ko dekhte hue, uh, ye dekhna padega. 
कि इससे क्या कश्मीरियों को कोई फायदा मिलेगा वेर हैज के तुर्की के अंदर खुद इंसानी हकूक की खिलाफ वर्जियाँ उस बड़े पैमाने पे हो रही हैं कि जिसमें पूरी दुनिया का जो मीडिया और इंसानी हकूक की तंजीमें जिन्होंने रिपोर्ट कंपाइल की हैं कि तकरीबन तैंतीस हज़ार सियासी कारकुन और ख़ास करके पॉलिटिकल अपोनेंट्स जो हैं वो तुर्की में कैद हैं गुजशत डेढ़ दो सालों से The speech of Erdogan doesn't come across as a surprise for he has supported Pakistan on several occasions for its wrong doings. Despite Pakistan's consistent support to the expansion of terrorism, his country has opposed Islamabad's blacklisting by terror financing watchdog FATF. Experts across the forum however believe that it is not just Pakistan but Erdogan's agenda is larger and more devious. He aspires to rule the world and securing the crown of the Muslim world is his first objective. But he hasn't been successful so far because of Saudi Arabia and its allies. Pakistan owes a huge debt to Riyadh but has lately been hugely inspired by Ankara. the partnership is growing multidimensional pakistan support in return will grow turkey stronger and more influential in the middle east erdogan's pro pakistan and anti india speech was followed by these bilateral prospects New Delhi has condemned its query saying Turkish president had no historical reference behind his statements and he was deficient of the facts while making speech in front of Pakistan's joint parliamentary session. It has also asked Ankara to refrain interfering in India's internal issues for it will have bearings on the bilateral relations between the two countries. Kashmiri activists on the other side said Turkish president had no right to speak over Kashmir as Erdogan himself was flag bearer of fundamentalism. Syria ki tabahi aur barbadi ke andar Turki jo jis tarah ka kirdar ada kar raha hai aur fundamentalism ko frog de raha hai to main samajhta hu ki samajhdar aur dur desh Kashmiriyon ko samajhna chahiye ki Turki ki हमायत कश्मीरियों के लिए किसी किस्म की कोई आ, मदद नहीं फ्राहम कर सकती क्योंकि तुर्की खुद इंसानी हकूक की जिस बड़े पैमाने पे खराब वर्ज कर रहा है कि तुर्की के अंदर आ, लोगों को डेमोस्ट्रेशन करने की इजाजत Turkish president didn't utter a word about widespread human rights violations in Pakistan occupied Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. The rights of people living here have been trampled upon by successive Pakistani regimes. While the land and resources have been plundered through tricks and intimidation, the indigenous people continue to remain deprived of their fundamental rights. The army generals who hold greater sway in Pakistani politics have treated them like slaves. Can the world ever believe a partisan monologue which was exclusively aimed at settling one's agenda and furthering it through Kashmir? Now we take a look at some happenings in Asia in our segment called Asia Watch. China's ambassador for the European Union in Brussels said that the economic impact of the coronavirus outbreak would be limited short term and manageable. Speaking at a briefing in the Belgian capital, Zhang Ming said that there was no need for global investors to worry, adding that Beijing had enough resources to offset the impact of the epidemic. Zhang said accusations that the Chinese government had not been transparent enough at the start of the epidemic were unfair, blaming lack of knowledge about the virus at the early stages of the outbreak. The comments came as China reported its fewest new coronavirus infections since January and its lowest daily dead toll for a week. The World Health Organization warned, however, that data suggesting the epidemic had slowed but should be viewed with caution. 
Members of the Tharu's minority stayed to protest in Nepal's capital city of Kathmandu, demanding the release of those imprisoned during the Madhesh movement that roiled the Himalayan nation in 2015. Demonstrators gathered in the capital with a demand that the Lal Commission report, which was formed to investigate atrocities during the movement in southern plains in the year 2015, be made public. The community also called for the release of Russia Janata Party Nepal lawmaker Resham Chaudhary, who was held guilty for the Dikapur carnage. The front also held a hunger strike in Dhangati city in Kailali district and called on for a two-day total shutdown from March 3 on self-proclaimed Tharuhat province to pressurize the Nepal government to address its demands. Rashtriya Janata Party Nepal and amalgamation of the then Madhesi Alliance who fought for amendment of constitution back in 2015 has long been demanding for the release of a report which was submitted to the government of Nepal in December 2017. The report was prepared by a commission formed under the leadership of Supreme Court's former judge Girish Chandra Lal in the year 2016 to investigate human rights violations in Terai Madhesh movement. The restive southern plains of Nepal witnessed bloodshed and widespread protest after the promulgation of the constitution in the year 2015. In 2018, an agreement was reached for NEC Australia to become the transformative partner for one of the most progressive and well-known registered entertainment venues in the state of West HQ in Sydney's West. West HQ is in collaboration with NEC Developing Technology Solutions for one of Australia's leading performing arts venues. It is creating an innovation center deploying NEC technology of IT infrastructure, CCTV security and public safety with world's leading customer experience. Where the Sydney Coliseum is representative that we now are one of Sydney's landmark destinations. So as a landmark destination, iconic, something similar that would be representative of the Opera House and the Sydney Coliseum Theatre, like the London Coliseum Theatre and so forth, just, be, just evolved. The thing I loved about NEC was that you could throw them a question and they'd say, we solve it. It's about creating technology or having solutions for customers for tomorrow. Now that's amazing because we're building a destination for the future not for yesterday, for the future. And that's what we're all about. And, and, and NEC, just, God love them, they just fit and, and th their vision was similar. NEC Technology Solutions will bring envy to many venues at its set's benchmark for delivering seamless customer experience for all registered entertainment venues across the country. In recent years, the number of people with visual impairment is on the rise due to age-related issues which has led to the onset of eye disease such as glaucoma. People with such impairment face a number of challenges. Among these, one of the largest hurdles that prevents social participation is the inability to move around freely. Shimizu Corporation Institute Technology in Tokyo hosted a press conference to announce the establishment of consortium for advanced assistive mobility platform. It is aiming to improve accessibility in society and quality of life for the visually impaired. The consortium will develop an integrated technology solution AI suitcase that will support people's transport and communication with AI and will conduct pilot experiment and demonstration towards ultimate implementation in society. スーツケースにですね、カメラですとか、画像センサーですとか、あと、バッテリーやモーターを入れてですね、それによって自分が今どこの位置にいるのかということとですね、目指しているthe consortium was inspired by the research that IBM fellow Chaiko Asakawa conducted at Carnegie Mellon University, US, on navigation for the visually impaired. Through pilot experiment, the companies will identify the requirement for social implementation and aim to achieve a solution that resolves transport and communication issue for the visually impaired. 
Moving on to Afghanistan, where the incumbent President Ashraf Ghani has been declared winner of 2019 presidential polls. The Independent Election Commission declared that Ghani won a little over 50% vote to secure his second consecutive term. But his principal political rival, Abdullah Abdullah, has rejected the verdict, calling it an election robbery and a coup against democracy. Our report. Almost five months after the scheduled polls and a war of accusations and counter-accusations from all political sides, the Independent Election Commission of Afghanistan declared Ashraf Ghani as the winner of the presidential polls held in September 2019. Ghani crossed the threshold of 50% by few votes to avoid the second round of polling between the top two, securing another term for himself. The IEC had earlier announced preliminary results in December, which saw Ghani win re-election by a slim margin, but Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah dismissed the result as fraudulent and called for a full review. Ghani dedicated the victory speech to the people of Afghanistan and called for peace across the country. Man, Piruzi ra, Piruzi mardom ra, baraye mardom tabrik megoyam, wa men hai se khadim awalin kishwar ba team mutahed ma. لحظه به لحظه دقیقه به دقیقه از حقوق حق مردم افغانستان دفاع کرد موک سوله غوالو تل پای سوله غوالو ده وطن گوخته نده او دا تیم به انشالله و تالا طول افغانستان تا سوله را Results, however, have recreated the situation of 2014, where a political impasse cropped up following no side conceding defeat. Abdullah Abdullah has outrightly rejected the results, saying they were fraudulent. Speaking to his supporters in Kabul, Abdullah described the results announced by the IEC as illegal and a coup against democracy. He said he would form an inclusive government with his allies. نتیجه را که امروز اعلان کردن که نتیجه دزدی انتخابات کودتا بر مردم سالاری خیانت به اراده مردم و تمثیل اراده مردم بود از اساس از ریشه و از بنیاد این نتیجه را غیر قانونی می دانیم. ثبات و همگرایی به اساس آرای شفاف و بایومیتریک شده پیروز ای انتخابات است و ما با پیروزی خود اعلان میکنیم In 2014 the United States had brokered a peculiar power sharing agreement that made Ashraf Ghani the president and Abdullah Abdullah the chief executive of the country The relationship has since been marred by distrust and a jostling for power in Kabul. It seems that Afghanistan is heading towards a complex political situation. The Taliban and the United States too have decided to go ahead with the deal and a reduction in violence or RIV will be the first step. The U.S. has assured that agreement would be announced following the observation of the RIV phase. The agreement will not be a reprieve for the country as both the U.S. and Kabul wants intra-Afghan dialogue which the Taliban have refused since the beginning of the talks. With a population of over 1.3 billion, India is home to innumerable varieties of cultural patterns. Each state has its unique set of customs and traditions. However, 
The common feature that binds all of them together is the Indian heritage. Today, we bring you a Northeastern festival of Luingani, a seed sowing festival that marks the beginning of the new year to the local tribe of Nagas. People come together to showcase and celebrate their culture. Let's take a look. Seed Sowing Festival or Lungaini is one of the biggest regional festivals of India celebrated predominantly in northeastern part of the country. Over the time, its grandeur has traveled across the country and is now celebrated by tribals living in the other Indian parts as well. People with colorful bamboo headgears, women donning traditional attires with complementary jewelries, with the highlight of one such event organized in capital New Delhi. The purpose of celebrating Riri Panit is to promote our tradition and culture. Our tradition and culture is, is our identity and identity define who we are. We have a rich culture, we have a rich tradition and it is our duty as a youngster to promote our culture and identity. Organizers believe that the celebration of the festival at non-native places help promote the culture in different parts as well. Various cultural activities are showcased during the festival such as cultural dances and folk songs. Cultural attire shows the lighting of a fire, drum beating, traditional folk dance and songs mark the festivities of the day. During this festival, the community seeks the blessings of the Almighty for a bumper harvest. A talk of war competition between the singles and the married people was also held. We are in the midst of um, another culture and uh, of course we adapt their culture and uh, with that uh, with adaption also comes how we share our culture to others and this is the kind of time for our, for us to share our culture Lungaini celebrations have evolved over the years and its celebrations comprising a blend of history and contemporary have been successful in connecting the youth with its roots It's time for me to wrap up today's episode. We will be back next week at the same time. This is Yeshi signing off from the entire production team of South Asia today. Goodbye and take care. <laughs>